Israel would have never been protected during the days of the famine. And sometimes we ask, why does it take Yeshua giving up his life to bring us salvation? Why wasn't there another way? Thing is, because we are sinners and we fail and we get angry and uh, there was no other way. He was slain from the foundation of the earth. Okay, and Yosef was mistreated by his brothers as a type and shadow of Yeshua and then he goes to a place foreign to him, Egypt, where he is, he becomes second in command, and he is the one that, when the years of famine comes, he protects Israel. Okay, so um, Israel has a place, has a place to to, to stay during some terrible days, during some terrible years. Okay, so, yeah, it's trying to die. <laughs> okay, so now, Joseph, last week's, in last week's portion, he revealed himself to his brothers. And we talked about how Joseph revealing himself to his brothers was a type of shadow of when Yeshua comes back and reveals himself to Israel as a nation. And that every detail about what what happened with Yosef when he revealed himself to his brothers is details about what's going to happen when Messiah comes back. However, if you did, if you weren't here for that, you, you guys are gonna well, it's posted up on Facebook. Okay, I'm in the I'm in the process of uh, I think he wants to come back to. Uh, Okay, so, yeah, uh, it, it's, it's a shadow, okay, a shadow, a picture, uh, something to learn from, you know, and uh, I was telling you that if you, can, if you weren't here for the past couple of weeks, you can see it on YouTube, I'm sorry, YouTube, you can see it on Facebook, but I'm in the process of uploading, I downloaded all the videos since we started doing videos, and I'm in the process of uploading it to YouTube. So you won't be limited to um, Facebook. You'll be able to see it on YouTube at some point. Uh, it's a lot easier to download it from, from Facebook than it is to upload it to YouTube. So just be patient. Okay, but this, these, these are teachings from the Torah. These are teachings from Genesis that give us an understanding of what Messiah did. Okay, did for all of us. Okay, so um, there's we're, this is the last week from Genesis in Genesis. Next week we begin uh, the book of Exodus. Okay, so it seems like we've been in here for a very long time, ever since the end of the festivals. Okay, we've been celebrating um, and reading through Genesis. Well, now we're about to start Exodus. And each one of these books, these five books of the Torah, they, they give a different aspect of what God has done for us. You could say Genesis is the shadow book, full of things that lead us to understand who Yeshua is, what he's, he's done for us. And Exodus is actually a, a reminder, the entire book is a reminder of our salvation. Because he comes to save Israel. He comes to save us as believers. He saves Israel out of bondage, out of slavery, and he saves us out of the bondage to sin. So these next weeks are going to take on a very different, a whole different thing. Okay, and we'll see what the Lord does and what he says. But this is this is a whole different time. We'll say a little prayer at the end. Please remind me, Josh. Chazak, Chazak. Uh, at, at the end, okay, there's a little thing you say, and uh, at the close of, of each book of the Torah. So, anyway.
anyhow, uh, let's pray. Our better name is Yeshua, Lord. I just ask, Lord, that, that you would help me to convey what you want me to convey out of my heat, Lord. And, um, I just ask, Lord, that you would have your way, that you would come, you are welcome here, that you continue to do something in each heart, in each soul. Thank you for the worship. And um, I just ask, Lord, that you would take, that you would just come and inhabit these words, um, and inhabit everything here in, in this teaching in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Okay. The name of the Torah portion, if you look at your notes, is Vahi. Vahi. Everybody say by he. By he. It's not by he. It's by he. By he. If you don't feel like you're about to let one loose, you're not doing it right. Okay. <laughs> okay. The the root word of by he is chaya. Chaya. See, we're an expressive people, and you have been brought close to Messiah, to the covenants. So that means you have to become expressible, okay? So you can say, <sighs> okay? And don't worry about what Bali would say, okay? Because that is one of the Hebrew letters, okay? <sighs> okay? Chaya, it means life, to, to have life. He has given us all life abundant. Chaya, life abundant. Okay, maybe gadol chaya, I don't know. Um, okay, so let's look at Genesis 47, 28. <coughs> we'll read to verse 48, too. Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, and they were the days of Jacob, the years of his life, seven years and 40 and 100 years. Uh, so 147. Draw near to the days for Israel to die. Uh, so he called for his son, for Yosef, and he said, he said to him, If please, I have found favor in your eyes. Place now your right hand under my thigh, and do with me kindness and truth. Do not please bury me in Egypt, for I will lie down with my fathers, and you will transport me out of Egypt and bury me in their tomb. He said, I myself will do as you have said. And he said, Swear to me, and he swore to him, and Israel fell down upon his head, upon the head of the bed. And it came to pass after these things. The Lord said to Joseph, Indeed, your father is ill. So he took his two sons with him, Manashe and Ephraim, and so he told Yaakov, and said, Indeed, your son Yosef has come to you. So exert himself did Israel, and he sat up on his bed. Okay, now something happened here. Uh, the first part, I, you know what I call it? I call it. The two visits with, with Yosef, the two visits with Joseph. First he says, you know, he's getting close to his end, but he's not dead yet. But he wants to, he wants to see his son, Yosef. Okay? So, you know, he's getting close to dying. He knows he's getting close to dying. Okay, so he sends for his son. And he makes him promise. Now, why did he send for Yosef and not all the rest of the brothers? Because Yosef was in charge of everything. He was the viceroy. He was the one second command of all of Egypt. What he said was was written. Okay, he was second in, to to Pharaoh. Okay, so he wanted to make sure 
that you know, he knew that his brothers might forget to take his body out when they come out of Egypt later on. Okay, so he wanted, actually not when they come out of Egypt later on, when Jacob dies, that, that, you know, they might not care to take his body out of Egypt and take it back to the land. So he said, I'm going to make sure that this happens. So I'm going to tell the one second in command of all of Egypt, his authority. Okay, now something else was happening too. Do you know what it says in verse 31 of 47? It says, he said, swear to me, and he swore to him, and Israel bowed down upon the head of the bed. Now, he bowed down. Do you remember that there was a prophecy a few weeks ago that, that when we first started with Yosef, that there was a prophecy, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were going to bow down to you. Well, the brothers bowed down, but the thought, and obviously his his mother couldn't because she was gone already. Okay, Rachel. But the but Jacob, and this is where Jacob fulfills his part of the prophecy by bowing down to uh, to to Yosef. In a way, as a picture. Remember, this whole thing is a shadow of Messiah, and everyone will bow their knee. Uh, it's, what's the scripture say? Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Yeshua is Messiah. Well, that is typed and shadowed here in the story of Yosef and the bowing down of the brothers and the dream he had. Okay. Okay, so he, he fulfills that. He swears and he's not gone yet. It says, and it came to pass in chapter 48, verse 1. It means that now a, a, a time period has passed since that. Okay, he's not quite dead yet. He probably has maybe a few weeks, you know, maybe a few days, I don't know. But he, he goes away because this time, the first time, it was just, it was just uh, him that came. But the second time, and Prime and comes. Yes. Does someone have a question about anything? All right, just your thoughts going, okay. Uh, the second time, it says, it came to pass that these things, that someone said to Yosef, indeed your father is ill, so we took his two sons with him. So he knew now, Yosef knew that his father was about to die. So he said, I have to continue the blessing. He has to bless my, my sons. Okay, so what he does is, it says that he exerts himself. Now, uh, you know, normally you would ignore something like this, okay, but I, I can't. So in verse 2, someone told Jacob, Yaakov. Now, whenever it says Yaakov, remember, it's the flesh. It's Israel in the flesh. When it says Israel, it means he's in the spirit. Because he was given another name that's by the spirit. Okay, so, so it, he, he says that, it says here, someone told Jacob, Yaakov, and said, indeed, your son Yosef has come to you. So what happens? So he exerted himself, himself did Israel. In other words, he became Israel immediately. He became Yaakov in the spirit, Israel in the spirit. And he sat up on his bed. Now, exert himself. The word exert himself is very, a very important word. We're going to talk about it at the end. It's chazak. Okay. Chazak. It means to strengthen, to prevail, to harden, to be strong, to become strong, to become courageous. So exert himself did Yisrael. Okay? That means he was in the spirit. And he was strengthening himself for a particular reason. Because it was a prophetic utterance that was about to come forth. Okay, looking at let's look at, at chapter 48, verse 3 and 4. Yaakov said to Yosef, El Shaddai had appeared to me in Luz, in the land of Canaan, and he blessed me. He said to me, Indeed, I will make you fruitful, and I will make you numerous, and I will make you into a congregation of nations, and I will bless, and I will give this land to your offspring after you as a possession that is eternal. And now, your two sons who are born to you in the land of Egypt before my coming to you, to Egypt, mine they shall be. In other words, he had 12 sons. But what he's saying is, 
Your two sons, Menashe, and this is this is really important to see. It says here that uh, my they should be now. Look at what he says: Ephraim and Menashe, like Reuben and Simeon, shall be mine. But this is the order he said: Ephraim and Menashe. Okay, Ephraim was born second. Menashe was born first. There's an incredible revelation in what I'm about to share with you. Um, we're on page two. He gave a promise that you'll be fruitful, you'll be numerous, and, and, uh, and we're in the middle of page two in your notes. Four promises to Yaakov. And I want you to know something. These promises aren't just to Yaakov, because if you're born of the Spirit, and you have been grafted into Israel by the Spirit, these promises belong to you. I will make you fruitful. I will make you numerous. I will make you into a congregation of nations. And I will give this land to your offspring after you as an inheritance, as a possession that is eternal. Fruitful and numerous. And I will make you into a congregation of nations. Okay? From the Hebrew, this is what it's saying. We're on page three now, about the middle part. I will make you, Yaakov, fruitful and make you great. I will make you into a congregation of nations. Try this. Congregation set aside of the nations to teach the nations. Or a congregation amongst the nations. In other words, you will be set aside to teach the nations. Also, you will be amongst the nations to teach them. Listen, all of us who are born again and believers, we are not called to sit on our, you know. Tuchus. Tuchus, thank you. <coughs> the Yiddish way of saying but, okay. We are not called to just sit, okay. We are called to do something. God never makes tails. He always makes heads, okay. I don't care about there being heads and tails on a coin. There's only heads in God's hand. Among God's people, we are always heads. We're not tails. Now, if you're there to learn from somebody, that doesn't mean you're a tail. It means God sent you to learn so you could be a head. Because you need to teach. The whole purpose of the Torah, the whole purpose of being separate, the whole ter purpose of being uh, a people of God, a covenant of people, a covenant people of God, is so that through your life, you can be a witness of heaven above. You're bringing heaven down through you. And you are to testify. And you are to be a blessing. And you are be, to be multiplied. Okay? If you don't have a ministry and you have a lot of knowledge, you need a ministry. I mean, it's just, we need to spread this. It has to get out there. Okay? And there's different ways, too. You know, We've got this band, you know, uh, with Dean that we've been building here, and we would like to get it out there. And that's our goal, so keep that in your prayers. We want opportunities to share the music and share the message. And right now, there's still a huge church out there that's not receptive to the message because they're stuck being sitting on pews. Instead of being heads, they like being tails. You know, and I, I don't know about you, but I don't know anybody who's truly walking with the Lord who wants to be a tail. Okay, they get something, they learn something, it confirms something in their spirit, it confirms they're hearing from God, and they get a chance to share with other people. That's what it's all about. We're not here to have a nice religion. I'm as anti-religious as you can get. Okay. Well, maybe not completely. I'm sure there's somebody over there. You sound kind of religious to me, but that's it. All right. So, Yosef. Now let's break down some of these names. Uh, the name Yosef, or Joseph, as you have in your Bibles, means to add or to increase. So think about it. There was a prophecy in the name of Yosef that through him, Israel was going to increase. By how many? Ephraim and Manasseh. By two. But there's more to that. Okay? So so here are his two sons. Menashe means cause to forget. And 
Ephraim, uh, one of the meanings is double ashy, but I, I like the word that means place of fruitfulness. Doubly fruitful. Okay? So one has a meaning that means I, I, I've been caused, I, I forget. I forget all the pain I've been through. I have been through nothing but pain! And the other name, uh, the other name, that was Menashe, by the way, the other name, uh, Ephraim, means I'm fruitful, I'm multiplying. Which one sounds better? Which one would you rather be? The Ephraim or Menashe? Well, there's a wonderful thing in both of these. Uh, but, yeah, Ephraim is the better one. So who does he pick first? Ephraim. But it's not him. Jacob is not saying Ephraim and Manasseh will be mine. He, he's saying there's something more. And this is what we're going to find out. Okay, this whole portion is about this. Okay. Manasseh was the firstborn of Yosef. Manasseh means we're, we're at the bottom of... Uh, of page four. Renache means to forget. This is not good in prophetic form. It is about a future trouble for the children of Yaakov when they forget his ways and walk away from him. He represents the son of Yaakov who forget. He is the oldest brother. I'm sorry. He represents the sons of Yaakov who forget. Those who forget. He is the oldest brother. He represents the scattering of the sons of, of Yaakov. Elohim does not forget. He could also represent the Gentiles in the world without covenant with, with God, without covenant to Yehovah, our Elohim. In other words, the Gentiles who don't believe in, in Messiah. He is also a reminder of the pain of being separated from his brothers and fathers. That's why he named his son Menashe, because he was separated from his brother. And he says, this child has made me forget. But really what he was saying is, there's such joy in this child that I forget. I'm, you know, it, it's not so bad, the pain that I have being away from my brothers. Okay, so, uh, so he, he's also a reminder of uh, the suffering of Messiah, who suffers for us, takes away our sins. Uh, and when he takes it away, our sins, when he takes our sins away, it's not remembered anymore. Okay? The Manashe represents the coming, the first coming of Messiah who comes to take our sins away. But at his resurrection, Yeshua became Ephraim, the fruitful one. Okay? So, so here is in the story of Ephraim and Manashe, if, on top of the fact that Yosef's life was all about Yeshua, his sons are going to be all about Yeshua. His first coming and his second coming. Okay? Okay, now, uh, this is why Israel says, uh, actually, we need to read a few more verses. Okay? Where were we at? Okay, we were we had just finished verse five, where, he, where Yaakov is saying or Israel is saying Ephraim and Menashe are going to be mine now, like Reuben and Simeon shall be mine. Verse six, but your progeny, in other words, your seed after this, with your wife, will, which you beget after them, they shall be yours. By the name of your brothers, they will be called with regard to their inheritance. But as for me, when I came from Padan, she died on me. Rachel did. Rachel. In the land of Canaan on the road, while there was yet a stretch of land to come to Ephrat. And I buried her there on the road to Ephrat, which is Beit Lechem, Bethlehem. Then Israel saw the sons of Yosef. And, and this is very interesting. It says, Israel saw the sons of Yosef. And he said, Who are these? But he just brought them there. So what's what's the question? What's going on here? Okay? He already, they already saw, he already saw his two sons, so why is he saying who are these? Because Israel, uh, Yaakov is Israel, he's in the spirit. And now he's seeing, he, when he says who, he's not saying he doesn't know, it means, he's saying, let me tell you about these two now. I don't know them the way God knows them. 
And I'm going to tell you something about them. Who are these? Said, and, and Yosef said to his father, My sons they are who were given to me by God here in Egypt. He said, Bring them please to me and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Yisrael were heavy from old age and he was not able to see. So he brought them near to him and he kissed them and he hugged them. <coughs> said Israel to Yosef that I would see your face. I didn't even think I would see your face again, Yosef. And indeed, he has shown me God has also you, you, your offspring. Then Yosef brought them out from between his knees and he bowed down with his face toward the ground. And Yosef took the two of them, Ephraim with, with his right hand, and on the left of Israel, Menashe, with his left hand to the right of Israel, and he brought them near to him. But Yisrael extended his right hand and placed it on the head of Ephraim, though he was younger. Now let me explain this to you. The right hand is symbolic of the inheritance. And, and they would lay their hands on their children and they would pronounce the blessing. When Remember when uh, Yitzhak, Isaac, pronounced the blessing upon Jacob? And remember Jacob? You know, he kind of tricked his father. Excuse me tricked his father and got the blessing. It was a laying on of hands. Well, there's a laying on of hands, and when it's the right hand, it means the blessing, the, the blessing of inheritance. Okay, so what Israel does, or actually, yeah, what Israel does, what Yaakov does is he switches hands. So Joseph arranged, arranged for his sons to be, make it real easy on his father, right? I'm just going to put Ephraim on his right hand, and you know, by by Yaakov's. Uh, it's kind of always well, hard for me to explain this, but basically he has to cross hands, okay? And basically the right hand is on Ephraim, and the left hand is on Menashe when it should have been the other way, okay? It because Menashe was born first, okay? Now this is really important. Okay, so uh, so something is happening, something incredible. And he placed it on the head of Ephraim, through, though he was younger, and the left hand on the head of Menashe. He wisely directed his hands, for Menashe was the firstborn. He, he blessed Yosef. He blessed Yosef, and he said, The God that walked, that walked in, my, in my forefathers before, and Abraham, Yitzchak, the God who shepherds me, from my inception until this day, the angel who redeems me from all evil, may he bless the lads. May he bless the lads. And there shall be declared upon them the name and the names of my forefathers, Abraham and Isaac. And may they proliferate like fish in abundance, to abundance within the land. Verse 17. Yosef saw that he was about to place his father was his right hand on the head of Ephraim, and it was wrong in his eyes. This is in the eyes of Yosef. So he supported his hand, the hand of his father, to remove it from upon the head of Ephraim, to put it on the head of, of Menashe, and said Yosef to his father, Not so, father, for this is the firstborn. The firstborn got the, the rights, the inheritance. Okay? Place your right hand on his head. But his father refused, saying, I know, my son, I know. Also, he will become a people, and also he will become great. Yet his brother, who is younger, shall become greater than he, and the fame of his offspring, now get this, will be such as fills the nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, By you shall Israel invoke blessings, saying, May God make you like Ephraim and like Menashe. And he put Ephraim before Menashe. And Israel said to Yosef, Indeed, I am about to die. God will be with you and will bring you back to the land of your forefathers. And as for me, I have given you Shechem as one portion more than your brothers, which I took from the hand of the Amorite with the sword and with my bow. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. you got to catch what's going on here. He's saying something about Ephraim that his seed will fill the nations. Okay? Now, I believe this, this is because of Yeshua, 
what he did for us. He died, died for us. And that's how Menashe was fulfilled in his life. Uh, Ephraim is the fruitfulness of what Yeshua did for us. It's symbolic of the fruitfulness of what he did for us. When everybody believes, they become like a part of Ephraim. You understand? In the spirit. In, Ro in Romans chapter 11, you are joined to the covenant. You are joined by spirit. You are a wild olive branch that's been joined against the nature of the olive tree. You you know, you, you are not the, a natural branch. Israel was a natural branch, but in the physical. But there is a spiritual branch. You have been added in. You've been grafted in, contrary to nature. It says in Romans 11. All believers, they are a part of Israel. A part of Ephraim. Why do I say Ephraim? Because Ephraim and Manasseh and Ephraim is about Yeshua. Period. Yeshua's first coming in Manashe, and Ephraim, his second coming. And, and all that he's given, everything, all authority has been given to him. And that's every soul that comes into the Lord. It's symbolic. Now, I have heard this taught in what's called the two-house movement in the church. Have you, have you ever heard of that? Two-house movement, replacement theology. Oh, the church has replaced... Physical Israel now, so we we don't you know we don't have to do the Torah, we don't have to do all of this. And then there's this other group that's, that that has come up called the Two House Movement, and they've been around for about maybe 25 years or so, okay. And they believe that the Gentiles are no longer they should observe the Torah the same as the rest of Israel. Okay, that they are Ephraim, the lost ten tribes. Again, trying to take a physical thing and turn it away from the spiritual meaning and turn it into a physical meaning. Okay, there is no two house. Okay, there is no two house movement. There is really no denomination in reality. We are all supposed to be one, a whole new man, one new man, made up of Jew and non-Jew, Made up of Israel, physical and non-physical uh, Israel. Okay, it's it's not. It's like this. All these doctrines of replacement theology is just plain ignorance. Trying to say that we are better than Israel. They dropped the ball, so we picked it up. Okay, kind of like in football. Okay, what I'm saying is that that they want to be the ones that are right and leave Israel to, to die. Leave Israel to, to go to hell. Okay? And that is demonic. Because God has a purpose for natural Israel. Throughout the scriptures, he says, I will join the two together and they will become one. Okay? Even it, it is a prophecy about Judah and Ephraim coming together. Okay, this is, this is really cool. Okay, so those, if you run to people like this, and you will run to people like this, I am positive. Okay, they're going to tell you you're not doing Torah well enough. You have to do it by the letter of the law, because God, God gave that to, to, to the Gentiles as well. That's not true. Okay, listen, if we don't, are not doing Torah because we want to, because we want to know him, there's, it's, we're already messed up. If we're doing Torah because someone said you have to do this because the law says that, that's the letter of the law. That's bondage. God gave us the Torah to do out of our own free will because we want to, because we want to know Messiah. That's a representation of Messiah. We parade the Torah around every week as a symbolic to remember that in the future, the Torah is going to go forth from Jerusalem and all the nations are going to flood to Jerusalem to hear the word of the Lord, to hear the Torah. Okay, so... You know, there, there's two sons here, and they are symbolic. And, and Jacob, or Israel, saw it. And he said, what are these? I, I don't understand this. But then he begins to prophesy. Okay, he begins to prophesy that, you know, Manasseh is going to be cool. He's going to be great. He's going to have a lot of children. But let me tell you something. Ephraim is going to fill the nations. Throughout the scriptures, Ephraim, God 
compares a bride to Israel, the whole nation, not just the ten tribes. So he's, he sees a bride as representing all the believers and all the physical Jews and Israel. They're all one, okay, in God's eyes. Ephraim is Israel to God. And I can show you a couple of scriptures about that. Uh, let's look at, uh, you know what, I have, I have a couple of scriptures here. We're on page five, okay. Uh, I want you to think about there's other meanings to the two sons, the two sons of, uh, of Yosef. Uh, causing to forget, Menashe. This is what I believe in, and I believe that the scriptures support this, and the scriptures that I have in this note support this. It has to do with the scattering of Israel, the rejection, the rejecting of Messiah. Okay, and then Ephraim has to do with the regathering of the nation of Israel. So even though it has to do with also all the believers that have come in, it also has to do with Israel's rejection and then coming to Messiah, becoming believers. Okay, uh, look at Isaiah two six. Isaiah 2, 6. For you have abandoned your people, the house of Jacob, because they are filled with influences from the east, and they are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they strike bargains with the children of foreigners. Okay, so the whole word abandonment, the whole word of forsaking is connected to the word menashe. Okay, chapter 49, 14 to 16. Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me, and the Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. Behold, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Um, Lamentations 5. That's right after Jeremiah. Yeah, Echa in Hebrew. Lamentations 5, 19 to 22. <clears throat> you, O Lord, rule forever. Your throne is from generation to generation. Why do you forget us forever? Why do you forsake us so long? Restore us to you, O Lord, that we may be restored. Renew our days as of old, unless you have utterly rejected us and are exceedingly angry with us. Okay, there's a purpose and a time. Okay, this is the, re this is, this had to happen. This had to happen because they, because our people cursed themselves. They rejected Messiah. They rejected the, the, the heaven sent Messiah. So, you know, it says, you know, when, remember when they, they had the opportunity to release, they say, here's Barabbas, son of the father. Or do you want to release Yeshua? You know, you're you're the son of, of God, pretty much. Okay, the son of the Father. Okay, so they said they said Re release Barabbas, and he couldn't kill him, or at least that's what he said. Uh, Pontius Pilate, he said, I, I can't put him to death. You know, his blood. I can't have his blood on my. But he had to listen to the people because that's one of the things that the Romans used to do for Israel release. A prisoner every year on Passover. Okay, well, so he had to release Barabbas, and and then he they, he sentenced Yeshua to the cross. Okay, but he said, "My blood, I, I, this is not. I'm not doing this." You know, my wife even told me I had a bad dream about this. Okay, so but he went ahead and and he said, "I washed my hands of this." Yeah, right. Like he can wash his hands of of the guilt that he has of putting Yeshua on the cross. But the reality is this. The people said, his blood be on us and on our children. Do you realize how, how serious that is? In other words, the condemnation 
for what would happen to Yeshua remains upon the Jewish people, upon all the people of Israel. Okay, the 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 forgetting, the I mean the the the, the you know, like that we are forsaken. You know, the Jews, Israel, are like, um, they're scapegoats. They're scapegoats in the nations. Okay? And and everybody blames, oh, you know, you're Christ killers. I grew up hearing that from probably Christians or Catholics who, who said that to me. You know, you're a Christ killer. You know, the thing is, I don't even know who Christ was when they would tell me that. But I, I but because of this, Jews have a hard time with Yeshua, with with the, with Jesus. You know, I could go to Israel for uh, and believe in anything. I could be a flaming homosexual. I could be I could be uh, a Buddhist. I could be you know and not have anything to do with the God of Israel. I I could believe anything. But the moment I believe in Jesus, oh my God, it's like I'm condemned. The nation will not let me in, even though I'm a Jew fully Jewish, they will not let me in because I believe in Jesus. Because there's been such stigma thrown uh, toward Jesus by believers. You know, maybe they, they didn't know any better, but still it's very hard for, for Jews to come to the Lord. Okay. You know what? But they will. They will come because they're going to fulfill the prophecy of Ephraim. They are fulfilling the prophecy of Menashe, but they, they will fulfill a prophecy of, of, of Ephraim. Okay, now, what is Ephraim? Go to Isaiah 40, verse 1 and 2. <clears throat> comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Okay, look at Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31 is about uh, the salvation of Israel. Um, well, let me find my physical spot. spot. Uh, okay, at that time declares the Lord, I will be a God of... The, I will be God, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness, Israel, when it went to find its rest. And the Lord appeared to him from afar, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore I have drawn you with loving kindness. Again, I will build you, and you will be rebuilt, O virgin of Israel. Again, you will take up your tambourines and go forth to the dances of the merrymakers. Again, you will plant vineyards on the hills of Shomron, Samaria. The planters will plant and will enjoy them. And there will be a day when watchmen on the hills of Ephraim call out, Arise and let us go up to Zion to the Lord our God. For thus says the Lord, Sing aloud with gladness for Yaakov and shout among the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise and say, O Lord, save your people. The remnant of Israel. Now look at what he says here in verse 6. He, call, he says, From the hill Ephraim call and arise. Let us go up to Zion. So that's Ephraim. That's Israel scattered in the nations. Come up. I'm going to restore you. Behold, I am bringing them from the north country. Verse 8. And I will gather them from the remote parts of the earth. Among them the blind and the lame, the woman with child and she who is in labor with child together. A great company, they will return here with weeping. They will come and with supplication, I will lead them. I will make them walk by streams of water on a straight path in which they will not stumble. For I am a father to Israel and Ephraim is my firstborn. I am a father to Israel and Ephraim is my firstborn. Why does he say that? For Ephraim is a type and shadow of those who have been born again. Jew and non-Jew, everyone. They are not the ten tribes that separated from the Israel after Solomon's rule. Okay, I know there's a lot of people out there that, that believe that, but you know, at some point maybe they're they're right in their assertion, but 
spiritually, Ephraim represents all of Israel who believe in Messiah, and, and that means you too, Jew and non-Jew. Okay. Uh, hear the word of the Lord of nations. Now, verse 10. Declare in the coastlands of Har and say, He who scattered Israel will gather him to keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob and redeemed him from the hand of him who was stronger than he. They will come and shout for joy on the height of Zion, and they will be radiant over the bounty of the Lord, over the grain and the new wine and the oil, and over the young of the flock and the herd. And their life will be like a water garden, and they will never languish again. And the virgin will rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old sing together. And I will turn their mourning into joy, and I will comfort them and give them joy for their sorrow. And I will fill the soul of the priest with abundance, and my people will be satisfied with my goodness, declares the Lord. Uh, so I'm not going to go in more than this, okay? Do you all see how Ephraim represents all the believers? There's more scriptures than this, and it's in the notes. You can look at it. Okay, I only gave you a few, but let's, let me give you one more. <laughs> Chapter 50, 17 to 20, and I'm going to drive this point home of how this applies to you. Jeremiah 50, 17 to 20. I have them in bold, the ones that I thought would be most important. Jeremiah 50, 17 to 20. It's in the notes. It's on page 5. Top of page 5. Okay. Uh, Israel is a scattered flock. The lions have driven them away. The first one who devoured him was the king of Assyria. And the last one who has broken his bones is Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I am going to punish the king of Babylon and his land, as I punish the king of Assyria, and I will bring Israel back from his pasture, to his, to his pasture, and he will graze on Carmel and Bashan, and his desire, his desire will, will be satisfied in the hill country of Ephraim and Gilead. In those days and at that time, declares the Lord, search will be made for the iniquity of Israel, but there will be found none. And for the sins of Judah, but they will not be found, for I will pardon those whom I leave as a remnant. They're always called a remnant, because a lot of people are going to die in the coming days. And there's only going to be a remnant. God's going to save the remnant of Israel. And it says that in Romans 11, too. Okay, so this is, this is the reason I'm bringing all this up is now the personal application of all this. We, when we are not walking with the Lord and we're walking in the flesh, we are like Menashe, and we're not going to have the end of pain and troubles. But when we're walking by the Spirit, we're like Ephraim, and we're fruitful, and we're blessed. Okay, and that God wants us to, to, to walk blessed. That means he wants us to be those who love God with all our heart, soul, and strength, and, and love our neighbor as ourselves. He wants us to, to be, he is our God, and we are his people. You know what that means? He is our God, and we are his people. That's, that's not just a nice saying. We are close to him. There is no alternative but being close to the Lord. There is no alternative but truth. We, we throw away the lie, and we take up the truth. The lie is Menashe. Okay. The truth is Ephraim. Okay. Now, do you all remember the story of uh, in Luke 15, 11 to 32? Uh, just go to go to that. I think we're gonna finish finish with that one. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna finish with that one. And we'll have a couple more scriptures and then that'll be it. Luke 15. Luke 15, verse, start in verse 11. And he said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, uh, Father, give me the share of the estate. 
okay, that falls that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them, and not many days later, the younger son gathered everything. Remember the prodigal son here? The younger son, uh, okay, here we go. The younger son gathered everything together and went on the journey into a distant country, and there he squandered his estate with loose living. He was kind of like Menashe, okay? And now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in the country, and he, became, he began to be impoverished, so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into the field to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods of the swine that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he, he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And, and the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slave, quickly, bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, and sandals on his feet, and bring the fat to calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. That's what it is to become born again. And he was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. And the older son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing, and he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things, what's happening? And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fat calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go on, and his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, look, for so many years I have been serving you, and I, never, and I have never neglected a command of yours, yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, he who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fat calf for him. And he said that, son, you have always been with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. Now, what this is talking about is two-sided. If, I'm going to simplify this for you. He was living like Menashe. Like everything's forgotten, everything's gone, my life is done. But he came and he became like he's a part of a thrive now. He, his life came back to him. That's what it means to be born again. Okay, so uh, what happened is Israel and Ephraim, the younger brother you could say is Israel. Israel has squandered the things of God. They messed up, and then they come back. Okay, and, and they're again close to the God of Israel. And there's a jealousy because all the believers say, you know, we, we walk with you, but why are you celebrating the, the Jews coming back to you and Israel coming back to you? And you didn't celebrate, you know, I was going through, you know, a hard time here. Doing your word, following your will. Okay, what? Should we also say that Judah is a picture of the older of the older no, son? I don't, I don't want to, this, we'll talk about this later. Okay. Okay. There's a reason I'm telling you this. Because I'm going to go to that side of it. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. I'm sorry. Okay, there's two sides of this. There's also the side that this could be the Gentiles wandering in the world. They're like Ephraim. I'm sorry, they're like, they're like Menashe. And they're wandering. And here's the, the Israel who followed his commandments. Of course, we know not all of Israel follows his commandments. But what I'm saying is that they are like the ones that, hey, that we had all the, the law, we had the Torah, you know, they could be even the Messianic Jews, we had all this. But why are you celebrating the Gentiles coming in? So there's two sides to look at this. But this will simplify it for you. Menashe and Ephraim. Menashe and the younger brother. No, I'm sorry, Ephraim was the younger brother. No, Menashe here represents the one who is squandered everything, who's lost everything, who feels like it's all forgotten. But then he becomes 
born again into his back. This really is an application for everyone who goes from a life without the Lord to a life with the Lord. Okay? We are Ephraimites, all of us, but we're all Israelites. Okay? And, and there's still a plan that God has to save the physical nation of Israel. And you have to understand that plan. That's what we've been talking about through the life of Joseph, and now we're talking about it through his sons. Okay? And this plan is very close to the heart of God. If you can understand it, you won't be like the older, jealous brother and saying, well, what about me? You know what? You will rejoice. Like the father is rejoicing at the returning of his son. Okay? So we need to all rejoice. You know what? Some of us have been really privileged. We're in his kingdom. You know, you know I, so many times me and Josh and others are saying, you know... If we could just be there, if we could just stand there, we don't even have to be at the, the closest spot to Messiah. Just that we could make it to the kingdom. Listen, it's so serious on salvation. We are a great danger every day of losing our soul. That's why it says in Scripture we have to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We have to live according to the word. We need to learn and, and grow. We need to change. We need to be ready. Listen, we can't get used to being in the pews anymore. Sit down and, and, and having it easy and, and not changing. Okay, we have to make changes. Yes, the God's calling from our Uh So you know, we, have to, we have to make changes in our lives. We have to be ready to move on. And if there's something that we like and are comfortable with, we have to be ready to say bye to the comfort. And say, hey, you know what? I want what God has, and if that means that I lose all this, all these wonderful things that I like, all these other gods that I put before the God, then we have to be ready to do it. And also, there's another way of putting this. If you have a doctrine or a belief, you have to be ready to throw it away. I'm always ready to throw something away. Okay, if, if someone shows me in the scripture something that I haven't seen before, and I was teaching something wrong, Everybody in our group knows that I'm always saying, hey, I was wrong. I, I, I taught that wrong. You know, <laughs> because we have to recognize that even though we're ministers and, we, and we've been doing this a long time, we don't know it all. We barely know about God. You know, there's others that might not know as much as we do, but still we barely know about God. We're, I'm always ready for what... If, if I'm wrong, to be proven I'm wrong so that I can change and learn what's true. Because it's the truth that will set us free. Okay, so let's be like Ephraim. Let's, let's embrace the character of fruitfulness and blessing. And we will have fruitfulness and blessing. It might be hard, and we might not have too many of our family members going with us. But they're going to be stuck in Menashe, and that means they're eventually going to end up in hell. And that's what we really need to pray. We really need to pray for those Manas, Manasseh people, Menashe people that we know to come and become a part of Ephraim. For those that are not born again to be joined to those of us who are. You know, we are, you know, we are the goal. Okay, this is the goal. Anyhow, just a couple more scriptures and we'll finish. Uh, look at... Psalm 108.8. We're on page 6 now. <clears throat> Gilead is mine. Menashe is mine. Ephraim also is the helmet of my head. Judah is my scepter. Okay. Uh... Ezekiel 37. No, just go to Zechariah 9, 13 and 17. I will bend Judah as my bow. The Jews are his bow. And I will fill the bow with a prime. Okay. So I, I'll, maybe you'll understand this a little bit better, okay? 
God's about to shoot an arrow here, right? He's about to shoot an arrow. Okay, this is what he's doing here. Judah, the Jews are my bow, and I will fill the bow with Ephraim, and I will stir up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and I will make you like a warrior's sword. And the Lord will appear over them, and his arrow will go forth like lightning, like what we sang about today. This, this, when he comes, okay, when he comes, and the Lord God will blow the shofar, the trumpet, and will march on the storm winds to the south. Okay, uh, oh, more. And the Lord of hosts will defend them, and they will devour and trample on, my, on the slain stones, and they will drink and be boisterous as with wine, and they will be filled with like a sacrificial basin, drenched like the corners of the altar. And the Lord their God will save them in that day as a flock of his people, and they are the stones of a crown, sparkling in his hand. For what comeliness and beauty will be theirs. Grain will make the young men flourish and new wine the virgins. Okay. Uh, let's, one more. Ezekiel 37, 15. Uh, I wanted to, uh, I was thinking I could skip that, but no, I, I really, we really need to read that one. Ezekiel 37, 15. So think about it. Are you the bow or are you the arrow? I think some of us are the bow and the arrow. Okay, but what I mean is that Judah is the bow and Ephraim is the arrow to destroy Greece. Now, he doesn't literally mean Greece. He means the Greek ways. Like all the celebrations that's going on these days with Christmas and Easter. Okay. Uh, Ezekiel 37. 15 to 28. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, And you, son of man, take for yourself one stick and write on it for Judah and for the sons of Israel, his companions. Then on another stick write on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and all the house of Israel. Okay, his companions. Then join them for yourself one to another into one stick, that they may become one in your hand. When the sons of your people speak to you, saying, Will you not declare to us what you mean by these? Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am going to take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, these are the believers, and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and I will put them with it, with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they will be one in my hand. In other words, they're going to be joined together with the Jews and Israel as one. This is what we're waiting for, guys. This is what's going to happen. This is what we're trying to do, Jew and Gentile together. Okay, and it says here, the sticks on which you write will be in your hand before their eyes. Say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will take the sons of Israel from among the nations where they have got, where they have gone, and I will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land, and the mountains of Israel, one people be king for all of them, and they will no longer be two nations, and no longer be divided into two kingdoms. They will no longer defile themselves with their idols, or with their detestable things, or with any of their transgressions. And I will deliver them from all the dwelling places in which they have sinned, and will cleanse them, and they will be my people, and I will be their God. And my servant David will be king over them, and they will all have one shepherd, and they will walk in my ordinances and keep my statutes and observe them. They will live on the land that I gave to Yaakov, my servant, in which your fathers lived. And they will live on it, they and their sons and their sons' sons, forever. And David, my servant, will be prince forever. And I will make a covenant of peace with them. And it will be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them. See? Multiply, that's Ephraim, and I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My dwelling place also will be with them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. And the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel, and my sanctuary is in their midst forever. They are all going to be one. Menashe, the ones who are scattered, come and are joined to Ephraim, all the believers. And all, all of the Gentiles who are called by his name, who have been joined, Ephraim, we're all together. Not physical, spiritual. 
This will set you apart from these two house people that want to say that we are actually physical Israel, the ten tribes, the Ephraimites. There is, you can see it anywhere. Okay, but if you're not wise, you can get caught up in what they do. A lot of many of the Hebrew roots people are caught up in this two house movement, which is they're trying to say Ephraim, the ten tribes, are you know Israel. And, and, they're, and they're making the division. But it's not. This is all spiritual. This word is spiritual. Okay. Now the rest of this we're not going to go over. There's more that I didn't cover. Okay. That you can look at in the notes. And there's a whole section from, from Genesis 49, 1 to 27. From Genesis 49 to the end of the, of the book of Genesis. And it's a prophecy. After he's finished talking to Joseph and his two brothers, he then gives a prophecy to all the brothers, and it's very prophetic. And I and I gave my interpretation at the end, uh, which is on page. Uh, I think it's the last page. Actually, I, I I put it throughout, so you can just look at it. There's more there to study, to learn. So let's do the the saying that we do. I I'll just have you repeat after me. When we finish each book of the Torah, there's a saying that we do. And it goes like this. So just repeat after me. I'll say it in English first. May we be strengthened. Everybody, may we be strengthened. Be strong. Be strong. Chazak. Chazak. Venit. Chazek. Be, may, be strong, be strong, and may we be strengthened. I did this in reverse. I didn't left or right or share right or both. Yeah. Okay. Be strong, be strong, and may we be strengthened. Abba. Lord, I just ask, Lord, that you just take this and seal it into our hearts. Abba, we need to understand, Lord, we don't have to be jealous of one another. <coughs> we don't have to feel like we're better than anybody else. All of us will fall to one of these two camps, into Manashe or Ephraim. Uh, but we want to fall to Ephraim's camp. Uh, but we don't want to be miserable. We don't want to be uh, thinking about all of our problems uh, but, and giving in to the weaknesses of the flesh. Uh, but we want to follow and be fruitful, follow you wholeheartedly, Lord, and that you will be our God and we will be your people. Uh, but, and what that means, Abba. Uh, that you know us and we know you. We don't want to be among those that you say, I don't know you. Go away from me, you, you people who don't observe my Torah or Torahlessness. Abba, I just ask, Lord, please watch out for all of us, Lord, in these cold days. Abba, I ask, Lord, that you keep us warm in your presence. Abba. And Lord, I, I thank you, Abba, that you, we would shine for you, Lord. Uh, us Ephraimites, us Israelites in the spirit, Abba, us Hebrews in the spirit, in the name of Yeshua. Let's do the closing blessing of the Torah. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam Asher natan lanu Torah atemet Rechai olam nata betuchinu Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has given us the Torah of truth. And has planted eternal life in our midst. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Yevarecha Yehovah v'yishma lecha. Yaya Yehovah p'nav lecha v'yichunecha. Yisa Yehovah p'nav lecha. V'yasem lecha. Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face upon you and give you peace. In the name of our Prince of Peace, our Sar Shalom, Yeshua HaMashiach, the one who's given us the peace that passes all understanding. May he make our way straight, Abba. Cause us to walk in him every day. Uh, every minute of every day, Abba, teach us your ways. Abba, for we are a people that love to know you that want to know you better, teach us, Lord, that we might learn, that we might know. We might know how great you are. Teach us about Yeshua, that we might know him. Abba, because so many people say, I know him and don't really know him. Abba, they're caught up in one letter of the law or another letter of the law. 
it, whether it be a letter or a teaching from Christian doctrines or a letter or a teaching from Jewish doctrines, it is not correct. Teach us your ways. Lead us, Lord. Come and teach us, Lord. It says in Isaiah, Lord, that everyone will come up to be taught of the Lord. Abba, we want to be taught. Abba, we want to get even deeper revelation, Abba, because we want to see and know you and know ourselves in the name of Yeshua.